Will you please turn in the Word of God to the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 1, towards the end of your New Testament. Letter to the Hebrews, chapter 1. We're going to be studying this book from now until just after Easter. This morning I want to give you simply an introduction to the book. We won't study any of it this morning. But I'm going to read the first chapter and the first four verses of the second chapter to give you a taste of the flavor of this wonderful book. Hebrews chapter 1 through to verse 4 of chapter 2. Incidentally, I'm reading from the New International Version, which I'll be using for six months as a trial to see how it helps you and how we get on with it. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father? Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Could I begin by asking you to raise your hand if Hebrews is your favorite book in the New Testament? One, two, three, just three. Might ask you again at the end of the series. My favorite book is always the last one I've studied. And so this will be my favorite, I think, by the end. But the fact is that the letter to the Hebrews is not the most popular part of the New Testament, as that show of hands shows. That's less than 1% call this their favorite book. Now, some of the passages in it are very well known. The chapter on the heroes of faith, you know, by faith Moses, by faith Abraham, building up to that tremendous crescendo, which has slipped into the next chapter by accident, of running the race and looking to Jesus, the perfecter 
or the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. I think you all know that chapter, and some of you may know one or two other texts. But why is it that as a whole, people do not like this book best? In fact, I would go so far as to say that you either love it as a whole or you tend to ignore it. Now, the reason is that there is a very real difficulty. It is the most difficult book in the New Testament, I think, not excluding the book of Revelation. It's the most theological book. It's the one that stretches your mind most, in a sense, and it's full of difficulties. One of these difficulties is that the book has an unknown background. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know when they wrote it. We don't know who were the readers. People have tried to guess, and let me just give you some of the speculation that's, that's gone on. But it's partly because we can't get hold of the real-life situation behind the letter. We can't just get the feel of the writer because we don't know who it was. We can't get inside the skins of the readers because we don't know who they were. But I reckon we can go a little way towards answering these questions. And if this is just background, then you can switch off for five minutes. But I think it's of interest. First of all, who wrote it? In the authorized version, it says the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews. But that, I'm afraid, is an addition, and it's highly unlikely that Paul wrote this letter. It's quite different from his style. In fact, he wrote pretty rough and ready Greek. He wrote Cockney Greek, or as they called it then, Koine Greek, whereas Hebrews is written in beautiful classical style by someone who obviously had a a very good Greek education. But here are some of the other suggestions. Some people have suggested Barnabas, because this letter is a most encouraging letter. It's described in the letter as a word of exhortation, and that means encouragement. And there's one man in the New Testament who was a real man of encouragement and exhortation, Barnabas. Now, could it be him? It may be. Another suggestion is that Apollos wrote this, a man who was learned in the scriptures, a man who knew how to handle the Old Testament in a Christian way. And Apollos may have written this book. Another suggestion is that St. Luke himself wrote it. There are certain similarities of style, and Luke was certainly able to handle the Greek language. But there's not a lot to be said for that one. Somebody else said that Priscilla wrote it, and because it might not be accepted at a woman's hand, she left her name off the letter. That's an intriguing and ingenious suggestion, but I don't think it carries any more weight than that. The suggestion that has been made, which I like best and which has a lot to commend it, is that it was written by a man called Silas. A man who was associated with Paul in writing his letters, and a man who was associated with Peter in writing his letters, and a man who knew Jerusalem and Rome well, a man who had a Greek education, a man who was a Jew and steeped in Jewish scriptures, Everything about Silas fits this letter. And so probably we are dealing with a letter from the hand of Silas. Now that's only a guess, and I'll leave it with you for what it's worth, but I'm impressed with that suggestion. But we don't really know, and the, the scholar about 1,600 years ago who said God only knows who wrote this letter was stating precisely the truth. Can we work out the date? Can we put it in its context historically? Well, I think we can go a little way towards doing so. For example, it's like a detective story, really. It's quite obvious from the way this is written that the temple was still standing in Jerusalem. It's described as an existing thing. And that was destroyed in AD 70. So we've set an end date. Can't be later than 70. Now then we can set an early date because, in fact, this is sent to second generation Christians who've been Christians many years and by now ought to have grown up and matured and not be on milk anymore but on meat. And so it's the second generation of Christians after the beginning of the church. And therefore we can say that the earliest date is 50. Well, now we're narrowing it down a bit. It's between 50 and 70. Are you interested in this kind of detective work? It begins to place the thing. Now, can we narrow it still further? I think we can. I think we can boil it down to about the mid-60s, but halfway between 50 and 70, because it says in this letter that the Christians have suffered loss of property, but have not yet suffered unto blood. 
Now that means that Christians had begun to suffer, but not yet been martyred. Now can we date that? Yes. The earliest martyrdoms began in the mid-60s, when the Emperor Nero began to get all upset, and when the great fire of Rome was blamed on the Christians. Before that, since about A.D. 45, in Rome, they had begun to experience loss of property. And in Jerusalem, they'd also done the same. They'd been turned out of their homes and had to flee for their lives. And so we've narrowed it down, and I think about the mid-60s would be right. Now, can we say anything about the people to whom it was written? Because this will help us to read it through their eyes. Well, now, it's written to the Hebrews, that is definite, and yet it's written to Christians. So we can say it's written to Hebrew Christians. It's written to Jews who have become Christians. Now, can we say anything more about them? Yes, we can say one very big thing. They have come out of Judaism, but not fully. They have come into Christianity, but not fully. And this is the basic problem for which the letter is written. And even if we're not Jews, we will get the message of the letter because the message is, leave your old life behind, including your religion, and go all the way with Christ. If you only go halfway, you will tend to drift away. Now that's the message of the letter. So it's written to those who had not fully left Judaism and had not fully entered Christianity. Those who were still keeping a foot in both camps. Those who were still half in half. Now if ever you've been swimming, when the water is cold, you will notice there are two kinds of swimmer. There are those who take a running leap and splash and come up gasping and say, it's wonderful, come on in. And there are those who climb down the steps until they reach the Plimsoll line about here, and they look utterly miserable, and they don't go any further. Now, those are the people who will hang around in the shallow end and as soon as possible get out again and go and change back into their clothes. Now, this is the basic problem here. It's of people who have not left their old life fully behind and have not matured fully into Christ. And therefore, having got in halfway, they're a bit miserable. And they are in danger of being discouraged and drifting away. And the writer is concerned about these Jewish Christians. They've half come over to Christ. And he is going to try and show them that even the finest of their old religion needs to be left behind now. And Christ is all they need. They must run the race looking to him. They must not be discouraged because persecution is coming. It's already begun. They've lost their property. They haven't yet, yet resisted unto blood. They may lose their life shortly. It's vital that when persecution is looming that you don't have half and half Christians with one foot in their old life and one foot in the new. You've got to run the race looking to Jesus only. Surrounded as we are with such a cloud of witnesses, we've got to set our eyes and just go all out if we're not going to be discouraged and drift away. You get the message? And even though we're not Jews, the message will be just as relevant to us as it was to them. Now, where were these Jewish Christians? Some have thought it was written to Jerusalem, because that's where most of the Jewish Christians were. But I want to put to you that I believe it was written to Rome. For there was a block within the Church of Rome that were very strong Jewish Christians. There was a real Jewish colony in Rome. Something like 80,000 Jews lived in Rome, and some of them turned to Christ. And if you study Paul's letter to the Romans, half the church is Gentile and half is Jewish. Now, it is the Jewish half in the Church of Rome that I believe this letter is addressed to. And because they are half in half, they are in danger of leaving the assembly of getting out from under their leadership within the assembly and going back to their Jewish religion because it's safer. You see, the fact is that in Rome, an edict had been made which said Jewish religion is a religio licita, which means it's a legally registered religion. You can be a Jew. But Christianity is a religio illicita, which means unregistered, illegal like the underground church behind the Iron Curtain today. And so these Jewish Christians knew that if they just stepped back onto the Jewish side of their life, they could be safe from persecution. 
But the author of the letter to the Hebrews is saying, if you do that, you'll separate from the assembly. You'll, you'll lose the leaders in Christ you have. You drop your Judaism and whatever it costs, go all the way with Christ. Neglect not the assembling of yourselves together. Submit to your leaders. Get right into the Christian side of your life. And then you're ready for persecution. Now, I believe that persecution may well be on its way in this country and may hit us within our lifetime. And that therefore this letter has a message to us to get right into the assembly, to get under its leadership, and to go all the way with Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Then we will not drift and not be discouraged. Why do I say I think it must have been Rome? Well, it not only fits the situation, but at the end of the letter, the author says, those who come from Italy send their greetings to you. Now, I think that's a pretty clear indication that it was written to the church in Rome. So have I painted the background by a little bit of detective work, a little bit of deduction. We've managed to put the letter about the right time and in the right place to the right people, and we've even had a, a go at guessing the author. That last point we can leave open. Therefore, secondly, having looked at the um, basic background, as far as the difficulties of the letter goes, not only is the unknown background a difficulty, and you might find it helpful to follow your bulletin outline of my talk this morning, but secondly, the unfamiliar ideas in this book are a difficulty. We're dealing with ideas with which we are not familiar in the 20th century. Take first a Hebrew idea, which runs right through the letter, like just as a scarlet thread runs through every rope used in Her Majesty's Navy. Running right through this letter is a scarlet thread called sacrifice. Now that's a Hebrew idea. It's also a pagan idea. Way back in Brazil, just a few weeks back, I came out one morning for an early morning walk from the Wycliffe Bible Translator headquarters in Brasilia, and there, right outside the gate in the dusty road, was a broken bowl, the remains of cockerels and even dogs, and I knew that a sacrifice had been offered during the night by some black magic practitioners right outside the gate of this Christian establishment. And there is this sense of evil there, 60% of the population engaged in spiritism. And I looked at the remains of birds and animals. And the whole thing was repulsive to me because I have never been used to sacrifice in religion. Neither of you, I presume, or most of you. And if you see slides or particularly a movie film brought back by some missionary of an animal having its throat cut and the blood going everywhere, I find that church people in this country usually close their eyes or turn away at that point in the missionary deputation um, show. We're not used to it. In fact, if, if we had blood all over this table and dead animals lying around the frontier like, like an abattoir, you'd be worried why we've got to the point now where we want an abattoir anywhere but in our neighborhood. You can have it down the road in the middle of a wood, but not next to our estate, thank you. We just don't like blood. We don't like killing. We eat the meat but uh, for Sunday lunch, but we try and forget where it came from. We don't connect it up. It came in a plastic case from the supermarket. It didn't come from an abattoir. And so we have this nice kind of respectable attitude now, and we keep it all hidden. But in those days, sacrifice was a vital part of religion. And it's only because Christ died that we don't have it now. And all this emphasis on blood and offering and sacrifice and goats and bulls being slaughtered, this is a strange world for us to live in. But I want to tell you, I don't believe you'll understand the cross of Christ unless you get back into this idea and get the feel of the blood that needs to be spilt in order that a sinner might come to God. So there's one idea that to us is a bit unfamiliar and strange. Now here's another idea. This time I'm taking an idea not from the Hebrew world but from the Greek world. Again a world with which we are sometimes familiar but the idea that I'm going to take now is just the opposite of the way we think today. It is the Greek idea of substance which comes into this letter again and again. Now the idea of the Greeks about substance is this if I can explain it. Now, we would say this pulpit is a real lump of substance. It's pretty solid, it's pretty real. The Greeks would look at it and say, no, this pulpit is only a shadow. 
The substance of the pulpit is somewhere else. This is only a copy of the real thing. And the real thing is in some spiritual world, some heavenly place. In other words, to us Westerners, the real world is this world and the shadowy, unreal world is the other world. And that's so burnt into our thinking that however much we talk about heaven, it always seems a little bit unreal. And the High Street Guildford seems more real to us. Now the Greeks, following a man called Plato, thought the other way round. And the Greeks said, the trees you see, the cobbled streets are unreal. They are shadows. They are only poor copies of the real thing which exists in the spiritual world. Now that idea is taken up by the author to the Hebrews. It's a Greek idea, but he uses it to say that all the sacrifices on earth were just copies of the real one. That even the tabernacle itself and the temple were just copies of the holy of holies in heaven, which is the real one. And therefore what we deal with in this world are shadows, types, copies, imitations. And the real thing is in heaven. In Jesus, however, the real thing in heaven came to earth. And the real sacrifice took place. And it's because we've got the real thing that we don't need the shadows. This is why, for example, we don't need an altar today. And we never call that table an altar. This is why we don't need priests today. This is why we don't need vestments today. This is why we don't need incense today. This is why we don't need sacrifices today. Why? Because all these things are shadows, imitations, copies, types. And the reason why we have none of those things in this church is very simple. We've got the real thing. We've got Jesus. We've got the real high priest. We've got the real sacrifice. And the real altar is not here now on earth. The real holy place is in heaven. And that's where our high priest is this morning. And it is through that high priest that we come to God. Now, that's a world of ideas that is strange to us. We almost have to pinch ourselves and then say, but that's not real. That's the shadow. The real thing is somewhere else. And in fact, the real eternal body that I'm going to have is not this one. This is only a copy of it. And this won't last for long. One day I'll get rid of this body. I'll be finished with it. I'll have the real thing. And so the book of Hebrews is saying this world is not the real one. This is the one that's a bit unreal. The real one is the world of heaven that came to earth in Jesus. Now, all that's about the difficulty of the book. So therefore, let's come secondly to the main question that the book asks and answers. And the basic question is the relationship between Judaism and Christianity, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now that's a very important question to get answered. Otherwise you can get a lot of other things wrong. What's the relationship between the temple and the church? What's the relationship between the Jews and Jesus? Now this question was bound to arise for five reasons. One, many of the early believers were Jewish as was Jesus and the Twelve Apostles. Some early Christians were converted priests. Many of them came to Christ as Jewish priests. What were they to do about their priesthood? A third reason is that after Pentecost, the early Christians went on using the temple for prayers every day. It was obviously the only building that was big enough to contain the Christian church in Jerusalem, which numbered 5,000 after a few months. But going to the temple, it was bound to raise the question, what about all these sacrifices still going on in the temple? Do we Christians take any part in that? A fourth reason is that the only Bible the early church had was the Old Testament. The New Testament wasn't written for some decades after Jesus died and rose again. And a fifth reason was that when all the Gentile believers came into the church, they were bound to say, do we have to become Jewish in order to be Christian? Now, this was one of the most deep issues that almost divided the early church into two denominations. It nearly did. If you study the book of Acts, within Jerusalem itself, the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers pulled apart. 
until things got more and more serious. Paul had to resist Peter on this question. And he had to write the epistle to the Galatians. And he had to go to Jerusalem. And they held two councils in Jerusalem on this matter before they settled it. And it was the thing that nearly started two denominations from the very beginning in the Christian church. But praise God, the Holy Spirit kept them from dividing. And they got it settled. But you see, there were those who wanted to keep the Old Testament and the New Testament so close together that you had to do everything in both of them. And there were those who wanted to tear them so far apart that the Old Testament ceased to be of any practical value to Christians. There are still Christians of both schools here today. I'll give you one example. Sunday observance is a very good case in point. There is nothing about Sunday observance in the New Testament for Gentile Christians. The Sabbath is a Jewish thing. But as soon as we raise the question of Sabbath observance, then you get all shades of viewpoint from those who say that the Christian is subject to the fifth commandment, fourth, sorry, fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and those who say the Christian has nothing to do with it, whatever. Now, the letter to the Hebrews in the fourth chapter deals with the matter of Sabbath observance and how a Christian observes the Sabbath. So we shall see that very question dealt with. And so some wanted to keep them apart, some wanted to bring them too close together. Do you know the first martyr, the first Christian to die for the faith, he was one of many thousands, but the first man to die for the faith died over this issue and died because he said Christians were not bound by Jewish custom. And he was killed, stoned, because of that. His name was Stephen. And the teaching of Stephen is very close to this letter to the Hebrews. Some even thought he may have written it, but it was written much later than that and after Stephen died. But his outlook is behind this letter. Now, what is the answer then to this appalling question? And it's a very difficult one. How do the Old Testament and New Testament relate? The answer is twofold. There is both continuity and contrast. And you have to have both answers. The continuity lies in the fact that God gave the old and God gave the new, and it's the same God speaking. The contrast lies in the fact that God was giving types and shadows and copies in the old and that the real substance came in the new. And that as Hebrews begins, in the Old Testament God gave his word in bits and pieces. But in the New Testament he put it all together. Do you ever do jigsaws? Or do you ever help someone else to do them? It's one of the most annoying practices, isn't it? You're just doing your jigsaw and getting on very well and someone comes and said, well, that piece goes there. Now, in a sense, the Old Testament is a jigsaw. It's like opening a box and looking at all the pieces. Some of them are right side up and you can see the color and meaning of them and some of them are wrong side up and you can't make anything of them at first. You have to turn them around and move them to look at them. But you see bits of color and you see a man's face on one and another man's face on another piece. And it's all in bits and pieces. But what the letter to the Hebrews is saying is when you turn to Jesus, you look at the picture on the lid. You see the whole thing put together. So there is continuity and contrast. When you've got the whole picture, you don't need the bits and pieces. That's what he's saying. And so there is continuity. Every piece of the Old Testament fits somewhere into the new. But when you've got the new, the pieces fall away. They're copies, they're shadows. When you've got the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, then the sacrifice of bulls and goats fall away. They're just the pieces that pointed to the picture. Now you're beginning to see there's both continuity and contrast. There's continuity because... Both are inspired by the same God and Christianity grew out of a Judaistic background and the Bible came to us written by Jews and Jesus was and is a Jew. I said in Brazil in one talk I gave, God is a Jew and somebody challenged me afterwards and said, no, surely he's the God of the Jews. No, I said, God is a Jew. God the Son is Jewish. He's part of the Godhead and therefore God is Jewish. 
And yet Christians do not become Jewish in order to know this Jewish God. Continuity and contrast. Now the letter to the Hebrews emphasizes, underlines the contrast. And it does so with just two words which come all the way through. And they are the two key words. So if you have a pen and you don't mind underlining your Bible, and I hope you don't, underline these two words whenever we get to them. Word number one, better. Better. Or I think in some translations, superior. And that word occurs 13 times all the way through. We have someone who is better than the angels. Who is better than Moses. Who is better than Joshua. Who is better than Aaron. We have a, a better sacrifice than bulls and goats. We have a better covenant than the old covenant. Better, 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 better. Of course, if you read between the lines, the author is really saying best. But the contrast is better. And the Christian way is better than the Jewish way. For Christ is so much better than all the people who were sent to help the Jews. So that's the first key word, the word better. But why is Jesus better? The answer is very simple. Here's the second word. Because he is the Son. The Son. The angels, are they not ministering servants? Moses, was he not a servant? Joshua, was he not a servant? The priests, were they not servants? The high priest, was he not a servant? But we have something better. We have the Son. The Son. And to have the Son of God is so much better than having servants of God. Your preacher this morning is just a ministering servant. How much better it is for you to have Jesus than me. Because to have him you've got the Son. And not just a servant. And this is the contrast between the Old Testament. It's full of servants of God. Noah, Abraham, Moses, Elijah. Go, go through them. Tremendous men of faith. Great heroes of faith. But when you've looked at them all and learned everything you can from them all, turn your eyes away from this cloud of witnesses and look to Jesus, the Son. And you've got someone far, far better. Have you got the contrast? And so the letter to the Hebrews is saying, look, you can leave your Judaism behind, leave your heroes of faith behind, leave these men behind, and turn to Jesus and go all the way with Jesus and run the race right to the end. And then you won't drift because you've got someone far better. You've got an anchor within the veil to your soul. You've got something to hang on to, someone to hang on to. You see, all these other servants passed from the scene. They came and they went. But Jesus abides a priest forever, stays with you. Now, fourthly, I want, therefore, to talk about the practical purpose of this letter. It's not academic theology, this. Sandwiched into a fairly theological argument, I agree with that, but sandwiched into the argument every now and again are most practical exhortations as to how you put this into practice. For example, having talked about Jesus being as the Son superior to all the angels, how does he apply that practically? He says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Thoroughly down to earth, you see. Suddenly he puts it into your life and he says, if Christ is so much better than the angels, you may never have heard about angels, but you've heard about Christ. And therefore, if that's so much better, how shall we escape if we neglect something that's even better than the Jews had? The better the religion, the more serious it is to ignore it. And since we've got the best salvation of all, how shall we escape if we neglect it? You see, hearing about Christ puts a greater responsibility on us than on the Jews. Now, this epistle is called a word of exhortation, and therefore it's divided in its practical side between the negative exhortations which are warning us and the positive exhortations which are wooing us to Christ, warning us of drifting, wooing us closer to him. If I just read through a list of the negative warnings there are, there's a warning of neglect, there's a warning of unbelief, 
There's a warning against disobedience. There's a warning against immaturity. There is a warning against rejection. There is a warning against refusal. One of the most serious passages and one of the most difficult in Hebrews is Hebrews 6, which warns that it is possible to have gone through the motions of becoming a Christian, to have tasted of the powers of the age to come, and then to fall away. And it says most solemnly, if that happens to you, there is no hope of coming back again. That's something more serious than just backsliding. It's apostasy. When we come to that passage, we'll have to look carefully at what it says. But it says you can get far enough into the Christian faith to have tasted of the powers of the age to come. But if you turn back then, you crucify the Lord afresh and there's no one left to save you and there's no hope of repentance. It's a solemn warning. Very practical one. On the positive side, however, the wooing always begins with two little words, let us, let us. And here are some of the positive exhortations. Let us fear. Let us give diligence to enter. Let us hold fast our confession. Let us draw near to the throne of grace. Let us press on to perfection. Let us draw near. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith. Let us consider one another. Let us lay aside every weight. Let us run the race. Let us have grace. Let us go forth unto him. Let us offer up sacrifice of praise. Let us, let us. And I've gone all the way through the letter in just singling out those pleas. Let us. And I hope that as we go through this letter, when we get to one of these let us, that our whole heart will respond and say, yes, let's do this. Let's respond. It is therefore at once the most stern and the most tender book in the New Testament. It has the harshest warnings and the most tender appeals of any book in the New Testament. And so finally this morning, let me talk about the value of the book. And I have five things that this book can do for people. I've put four on the bulletin. Put another one in the middle at number three, will you? Here's the first. And all these show that this book is not irrelevant or out of date, even though we're not Jewish Christians. It's so relevant to us. Number one, this book exposes religion. Religion is a copy. Judaism was the best copy there was. But you'll find traces of true faith in most other religions. Religions of this world are an awful mixture. They're a mixture of God's influence, man's ideas, and Satan's perversions. And therefore, in every religion, you can find some ideas that are good. For example, you can go to the Indians in Brazil... And you can find them offering blood sacrifices. And that's a good idea, but it's only a copy. And so this book of Hebrews exposes all religion as copy, as unreal. And it's saying when you come to Christ, you leave your religion behind. That's a lesson that many don't learn. But it's part of the, that which falls away. And even though your religion may be a well-nigh perfect copy of the real thing as Judaism was, then you still leave it behind when you've got the real thing. Too often religion creeps back into our Christianity and we become religious again. Religion is the enemy of Christianity and I've noticed that it's unbelievers who get so religious. Have you noticed that? It's the unbelievers who only go to church three times a year who when they do go want something very religious. They dress up for the occasion and they go through all the rites and ceremonies and they like that kind of ritualistic religion. Why? Because they haven't got the real thing, so they like the copies. And of course you need the copies when you haven't got the real thing. When you're not a believer, when you don't have faith, you've got to have the visible. You've got to have something to look at. You've got to have something that appeals to the eye, whereas faith is the substance of things not hoped, of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And therefore, those who come to this service by faith, you don't need a lot of vestments. You don't need a sacrifice. You don't need the copies. You've got faith in the real thing. And that's why unbelievers can come to a service here and they can say, well, it wasn't religious enough for me. Of course it wasn't. We only want the reality here. We've left religion behind. 
So first it exposes religion. Let us draw near to God. Let's draw near to Christ. Secondly, this book interprets Scripture for us. As I said last Sunday, if you've ever sat down to read the Bible right through, you probably got a bit stuck in Leviticus. But it's that very book that comes alive after reading Hebrews. It's that very book that is full of meaning for you. The sacrifices begin to have meaning because you're, you're reading them as copies of the real thing and helping you to understand the real thing, the sacrifice of Christ. So you look at the burnt offering, the meal offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, and suddenly you see all these five aspects of the cross. The cross is the real thing that includes them all. So it interprets Scripture for us, and it gives us great help with the part of Scripture we find most difficult, the Old Testament. Thirdly, and this is my extra one, I've already mentioned it more than once this morning, but I want to underline it, it cures sacerdotalism. That's a word some of you have never heard of, S-A-C, E-R-D-O-T-A-L-I-S-M, sacerdotalism. That's an ecclesiastical word, it would be, wouldn't it? Which means going high church, simple terms. And you know, high churchianity is simply a reversion to the unreal copies. It's going back to the Old Testament. It's going back to altars and priests and incense and all the rest. Can you see that? And the letter to the Hebrews should cure us of going back to high churchianity and getting all religious again. It's Old Testament stuff, that. And in Christ, we don't need it anymore. Fourthly, the letter to the Hebrews stimulates spiritual growth. Right there at the end of Hebrews 5, it says, look, don't go on being babies. Don't want a bottle of milk every time you come to church. You should be ready for meat. Now, as you know, I try and put the gravy on, <laughs> but it's not milk. And it says, grow up, feed on meat, chew the thing over, digest it, get your teeth into something that's tough, but grow up, go on, mature. And the whole of the letter to the Hebrews is an appeal to Christians to grow up and become strong Christians. So it stimulates growth, particularly, if I may say, second-generation Christians. Now, how many are there here this morning, I wonder? I mean by that those whose parents were Christian. Maybe your grandparents or great-grandparents were, but let's see how many of you had parents who were Christian or one parent who was a Christian. Now, look at that. Those who say the influence of a Christian home has no effect. That's about, I would estimate coming up to two-thirds of you. Now, the peril of being a second-generation Christian is this, that you slowly drift away from your parents' faith, that you never get as far into it as they got, and that you tend to be religious and have the form but not the power of godliness, so that by the third generation, the parents' faith has been lost. And Hebrews is written for second-generation Christians. Written for those who can remember great Christian leaders who've died and are no longer with us. And it's saying, remember them and imitate their faith. Get up to their standard. Go as far as they went. Go all the way with Jesus. Don't rest on their faith. Don't have a second-hand religion. But you go as far as they did. So it stimulates growth. Somebody has said the Christian life is like riding a bicycle. If you don't go on, you'll come off. In other words, you've got to keep moving. You've got to keep moving. There's always the exception that proves the rule. I remember the slow bicycle race at school, um, and one young man mastered the art of staying absolutely still on a bicycle. So he did, and he just stayed there, and then when everybody had passed the finishing line, he just tore up and went over the line. He really could balance on a bike stationary, but he's the exception. The rule is that if you don't keep moving, you'll come off. And it's the rule with the Christian life, too that unless you go on, you'll go off. Now, the final value of the book of Hebrews is just this. It uplifts Christ. 
There are some other epistles in the New Testament which don't put the emphasis on Christ, but on other subjects. Rightly so, God wants us to have it all. But the letter to the Hebrews, Christ is prominent on every page. At every stage of the argument, your eyes are turned to Christ. Whether we're discussing Moses or Joshua or Aaron or Melchizedek or all the heroes of faith, every time your eyes are turned to Jesus, make you look at him and fix your gaze on him and look to him for the rest of your life and the rest of your race. This is why Hebrews has sometimes been called the fifth gospel. The fifth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Hebrews tell us about Jesus. But if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us about his ministry on earth, then Hebrews tells us about his ministry in heaven. And therefore, Hebrews is the only book in the New Testament to concentrate on one aspect of Christ, namely, that Christ is our priest. Now, other, the Gospels talk about him as Savior and King. The other epistles talk about him as Lord. But in this letter, we see Christ as our priest. Now, once again, we're not used to the idea of priest. We don't talk about our ministers as priests. We are all priests in a sense. We are all believers. We all have access to God. We're all priests. But we have one high priest. And because we're not used to priests on earth, we mustn't forget that Christ is our priest in heaven and that we cannot approach God without a priest. No one can. And that you need to confess your sins to a priest. Let's not forget that. That's part of Christianity. And Hebrews uplifts the priesthood of Jesus Christ. May I say to finish that I believe that's why the author did not include his name. He was known to his readers. He didn't want to remain anonymous. But I think he wanted his readers to turn all their attention on the Lord Jesus Christ and look to him. Look to him. So as we go through Hebrews, we're just going to look at Jesus Christ and we're going to run towards him and we're going to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord. Let us pray. Father, we haven't even looked at one verse yet, and already our hearts are getting warmed as you open to us the Scriptures. And we pray that Sunday morning by Sunday morning, we may come here to look at Jesus and to rejoice in his reality, to leave behind all religion, so thank you for revealing this to us. Set us free that we may not drift or be discouraged. And if persecution comes, may it find us within the assembly of the righteous, under the leadership of those whom you have appointed, but above all, looking through all this to our Savior, for his name's sake. Amen. <laughs>